we'll get started momentarily. We're just letting everybody load into the Zoom app and we'll get started in about uh, less than a minute. All righty. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining the ACA Small Business Boot Camp and Resource Collective for this Tuesday, September 28th. I can't believe how fast uh, this month has flown by and we're almost in October. But I want to thank everybody for being here. I am Robert Theobald, Small Business Ombudsman and Vice President of Small Business Services here at the Arizona Commerce Authority. And as always, we like to start by thanking all of our community partners. We cannot do these boot camp sessions without them, their time and their expertise. As you can see, there's quite a few community partners uh, that we have as part of the boot camp. So those that are new to the boot camp, it is a designed to help small businesses work through the COVID crisis and return stronger than ever. It is a webinar series that we do every Tuesday and Thursday at 9 a.m. It is a statewide initiative supported by all of those community partners. And we have about 120 plus community partners that have participated in the boot camp and and help with it. So we are very appreciative of all of those community partners. And then it is a resource collective and a content library. So let's dive a little deeper into those last two pieces. First, we'll look at the resource collective. The resource collective, uh, you can find the link to it on the bootcamp website. Um, and it is a, a website we set up with additional tools and guides provided by our community partners to assist small businesses uh, during this time. We also have the content library, and the content library is an after effect of this bootcamp series. Uh, we started the bootcamp in April of 2020, and we record uh, most, if not most of the sessions. There are a few that we haven't been able to record because of licensing agreements with those vendors, but I'd say about 99% of them have been recorded. And we have those posted, those recordings posted on our website, as you can see on the screen there under the archive section. And that results in a content library of about 160 plus webinars that you can go back and review at any time, access the content, download the, the slide decks that correspond to them um, and review that material, uh, that expert material brought by our community partners. It's a great resource, there's no cost to access it. Um, and there's a lot of great information, again, from experts in the field. Additionally, we have a couple of websites um, that are available to everyone to help support during COVID-19. First is the state's COVID-19 information and resource website at arizonatogether.org. And then the ACA setup, azcommerce.com forward slash COVID-19, which is the COVID-19 business resources website that has information for all businesses, um, things on business guidance, funding opportunities, et cetera. Um, and that is available on that website. Some other tools that are available uh, to small businesses from the ACA are Small Business Services, our Workforce Division, and our Arizona MEP. These programs help support small businesses in a number of different ways that are available to everyone throughout the state. Additionally, we have our small business checklist, and this is for those looking to start, operate, or grow a business. And it helps those entrepreneurs identify the commonly requested licensing, registration, and compliance needs at the local, state, and federal levels. Uh, you can also find some business planning materials, the procurement and marketing opportunities, and a lot of other great information on this checklist. And again, that is available at no cost, and you can see the website down below to access it or the simple way to remember it is azcommerce.com forward slash small biz, B-I-Z. Um, so with that, let's look at some updates. Uh, we've been talking about this. We continue to, to share this information. Is PPP loan forgiveness. The majority of the PPP, the first round PPP loans that have not uh, been forgiven are small businesses um, with loans under $150,000. And we wanna make sure everybody understands if you've got a loan, a PPP loan, 
You, in order to get forgiveness, you have to apply for forgiveness. If you're not sure whether you got an, a PPP loan or an EIDL loan, you can reach out to the SBA and they can help you identify which program you uh, accessed so you can find out if it's a forgivable loan or if it's the EIDL, which is a, a longer term loan, low interest loan. With that, the EIDL program is still available and they expanded the limits. So if you got an EIDL loan early on and you're still struggling and you need a little bit more funding on that, you can apply to have your loan increased. Um, they increased the maximum loans um, up to $2 million for that program. And with that, it's not just for COVID. There are some, uh, some counties within the state that had flooding issues. Um, those counties are also open to the standard EIDL program. The EIDL is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. And it's not just for COVID. They have different, uh, they have it set up. It was started before COVID for natural disasters. And so some of those counties that saw flooding within the state are also available for that program um, under the flooding piece. And so that will also impact um, some of the rules. You may have started after COVID uh, came about, but you were impacted by the floods and you can, uh, so you may be able to access the EIDL through the flood program as a newer business. Also the employee retention credit, we wanna bring this up. This is a credit that is available to many small businesses with some significant funding. Um, and we wanna make sure everybody can take advantage of that program that qualifies for it. We did a recent boot camp specifically on that program. And so I encourage you to go back and check it out because of there is a significant amount of funding. And then the last thing I wanna to touch on is the Small Business Development Centers, other words known as the SBDC. Um, they are a no cost program throughout the state to help support small businesses and your needs. So with that, we wanna look at our upcoming session. So today we've got uh, holiday hacking and we're gonna talk about some tips and tricks that you can do to help avoid uh, some of the cybersecurity issues that are going to be in play this holiday season. Uh, then Thursday, we have building small business value strategies for a successful sale or succession of your small business. Um, this is with the Maricopa SBDC. You know, for those who are looking to sell your business at some point, whether it's looking to sell it in a year or in five years or longer, very important that you watch this session to get an idea of the most important things you need to do prior to selling your business and when you need to start doing that. Um, six months before you want to sell it is not the time to start. So that's why you want to make sure everybody knows that if that's in your plans in the, in the future um, at some point, then you definitely want to take a look at it. And on Tuesday, we have Package for Success, Cybersecurity Tips and Tricks to Help Prevent Being Foiled by Cyber Con Artists this holiday season. It's a part two of today's session where we've got two parts uh, with this, both great standalone presentations. And then on Thursday, we have our friends at the Arizona Office of Economic Opportunity and Workforce to talk about the workforce employers want. So for all you employers out there, all you small businesses, this is a workforce targeting uh, the programs that are available for you through workforce uh, and the state. So, uh, uh, great lineup over the next couple of weeks. We hope you can attend all of them. And with that, we're going to go ahead and turn the time over to today's speaker. We have Jeffrey Crump, and we also have Christopher Alexakis with us from the Phoenix Cyber Academy. Uh, we're excited to have them. So Jeffrey, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and turn the time over to you. Great. Thanks, Robert. Um... All right, great. Okay, so assuming Zoom's working correctly, everybody can see the, the screen with the holiday hacking on there. Yep, that's um, good. Uh, yeah, great, fantastic. So uh, again, thank you uh, very much, Robert, and your team for allowing us to get on here today. Uh, in this uh, two-part series that we've got uh, coming up, the idea is to, uh, as a small business, we're, uh, we're based out of Mesa. We're in the uh, Mesa Center for Higher Education, and we've got a a couple of parts of our organization. We've got the, the nonprofit Phoenix Cyber Academy, which is our, uh, what we call a uh, cybersecurity career accelerator. Uh, then we've got our for-profit side of the house and that's a cybersecurity training and consulting. Um, so 
the idea here is because we're we're a small business, we get it just just like a lot of you that you know the uh, there are things that we can do uh, as a small business that are can be very straightforward. And so what we're attempting to do on these next couple of sessions is to cover things with you as a peer small business to show you, okay, here are the, the, the types of risks that we face as small businesses. And here are some of the things that are pretty low hanging fruit that we can do to help kind of protect ourselves from some uh, uh, threat actors. So uh, most organizations, you know, out there today, if you, you know, if you're not familiar with phishing and spam, those tend to kind of be at the top of those uh, those threats that we face out there, but you know the idea of us being targeted as an individual is very different than our business being targeted, and so the risk can be very different as we go into some of these things that we're going to cover today. The idea is that we're going to we're going to cover off on a, on both of those things. What are some things that we can do, and certainly need to you know we'll hit on some things around fishing, but what are things that we can do to kind of protect our organization? And not just from those kind of more technical types of risk, but there's some brand related types of things that uh, uh, risk that we you know, can suffer so, uh, from an attack. So the idea is that we're going to show you some things that you can do uh, uh, to kind of help protect yourself prior to kind of getting ready for the, uh, the holiday season. So. All right, so uh, we're going to hit off on the most common threats facing, you know, small and medium sized businesses, how you can use what are called uh, site certificates. And again, we're going to go into uh, Chris that's on the line is going to we're actually going to show you some demonstrations of these things. Uh, email protection and, and, and why is that important? Not just so much as we know we, we likely have some, you know, an antivirus and anti malware type of software. And that's great to kind of protect us from those external threats that are that are coming in. But if somehow we get uh, become vulnerable and exploited, there are things that the bad guys will want to do to kind of uh, capitalize and use our email systems per, per, to perpetrate attacks and, and, and cyber crime. So we want to kind of protect ourselves on that internal internal side uh, to help protect our brand from those kinds of exploits. And then we're going to hit on some of uh, the simple resilience things that you can do to help protect yourself from ransomware. So ransomware, you know, as you, you know, we, we, we see it every day almost in, in the news. And, and so there are some things that we can do as a small business to kind of help protect ourselves pretty easily from those types of things. Obviously, some considerations that we'll look at, but uh, there are some things that we can do. All right. So spoofing is you know certainly one of those most common things and as i mentioned so there's that, that our business side or our website that we have to worry about and there's the people so the idea of spoofing is somebody trying to pretend to be us and us can be our website and us can be us as individuals and we're going to dig into you know how and why the threat actors are doing these kinds of things we're also going to jump into and talk about phishing and the, the difference between phishing and, and spear phishing and, and, and whaling and, and, and vishing and smishing and, and, and the, the same kinds of threats that we see that are coming through our email are, you know, coming to us from lots of different angles. And, and you know, what are the things we need to do to kind of protect ourselves from that? And of course, then uh, the resilience and, and backups being a, a primary means of doing that kind of a thing. Now, when it comes to spoofing, uh, there's this thing out there, you know, uh, these, these servers called DNS servers, uh, domain name servers. And what these, these servers do is they kind of act like traffic cops for information. And they, they, they you know, out on the Internet, we've, we've got these things called IP addresses. And these are numerical addresses that are associated with our websites. But we know that you know, there's no way for us to kind of remember, you know, our numerical IP addresses and, and you know, that's just not going to work. So we need to have those, those URLs that are, you know, human friendly, like, you know, www.mycompany.com. So a DNS server is the, the server out there on the internet, and there's multiple ones out there that translates that 
www.mycompany.com into a numerical address. And once you kind of type in that URL, it goes to this uh, DNS server and it tries to do a translation and says, oh, I, I know that website is sitting out here on the internet and here's the numerical address associated with it. So I'm gonna send that information there. And if it, but if it goes to one DNS server, it doesn't, doesn't find it, it can kind of bounce, bounce, bounce until it finds the authoritative server that has that information. Now, these, because it acts kind of like that traffic cop, these DNS servers can be exploited. So you'd imagine the bad guys coming in uh, and they're able to kind of attack one of these DNS servers and they start to change some things around. So if somebody types in www.mycompany, instead of it going to the legitimate numerical address, they, they change those settings to make it point to a malicious uh, website. And now that malicious website might be a, frankly, a, an exact copy of what your website looks like. It's very easy for the bad guys to make clones of our websites and put them out there. Um, but because they have control of that uh, version of your website, they can load it up with malware and, 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 and forms, you know, fake login information to capture users, you know, logins and passwords and and those kinds of things. So we want to be real careful with uh, uh, the DNS servers themselves. Now, likely you don't own a DNS server and, and you're reliant on the ones that are coming from your ISP, you know, what, you know, Cox or whoever's providing your internet service out there. But it's important to understand that because you, as, a, as an owner of that website, depending upon how you, what your hosting is like, is you have some control over those DNS settings that are in there. And we're gonna dig into some of those here in just a second. All right. Okay. So, uh, so we've talked about you know, the, the DNS server itself, but on your website, um, if an organization wants to have, you know, uh, present the, 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 the image of being secure out on the internet, then uh, they need to have a, what's called a site certificate. And effectively what a site certificate does is it provides encryption for that traffic for users going to and you know, exchanging information from your website. Now, as you can see uh, you know, on the screen, hey, when, when, when users today whether you're doing financial transactions on your website or not doing financial transactions on your website, in this day and age, people expect to see that padlock. And if they don't, that's a concern for them, right? They, and as we'll see in an example here from Chris in a sec, the steps that they kind of have to go through, that, that user experience certainly doesn't make them feel very secure, okay? So, uh, so Chris, let's pop open the, um, let's, uh, pop open an example here. I'll stop sharing so you can. All right. So as you can see on the screen here, uh, in the upper left-hand corner, you got the, the red triangle and, and uh, nowadays you, you've got this, your connection is not, you know, is not private. You know, as a, as a business owner, this is obviously not the experience that we want our users to have. So uh, the, the site certificate is what helps us get through that. So uh, Chris, you wanna click on that? And, and you can see that there, that, that there, you know, there's invalid information or there is no certificate available in there, okay? So Chris, are we going to go in and, and yes, uh, sir. pop it in there? Okay, so depending upon where you're hosting, you'll have you know, varying degrees of control over these site certificates. A lot of uh, uh, hosting companies, if you use Wix, uh, you know, we use SiteGround on some of our sites. So we use you know, different hosting companies for different ones, uh, but you'll have differing degrees of control over there. 
And sometimes they'll be installed uh, by default and, and sometimes not. You might actually have to come in and request it. Now, unless you have a, a rather large website, thank goodness, these days there's a lot of point and click that goes on for you to be able to put these certificates in place. And so you just click a field like we've got here in this interface and we'll be able to very quickly kind of install a site certificate. Um, in the old days, or, or even if you're using, if you have an enterprise type of a, a website, uh, the installation process can be a bit more complex and there's a, the whole uh, validation process that can go on in the background and, and contracts and, and having to kind of prove multiple steps that your identity, your business is who you say you are. Uh, fortunately, through when you're using some of the small business types of hosting companies, they're, they're inheriting that trust and that risk through that registration process when you sign up to become hosting and, and those kinds of things. As you can see on the screen here, there are a couple of different types of certificates that we can install. And as you go out and you, if you're looking, if you go Google for a site certificate, you're going to find a number of different suppliers that will or providers that will offer these up to you. And they can range from a few hundred dollars to several thousand dollars, just depending upon uh, what kind of features and functionality you want to get from them. Now, um, there's an organization called Let's Encrypt, and they actually uh, are an open source provider. Uh, and their goal is to create these site certificates that are very affordable for small businesses like ours. So if you see a Let's Encrypt and it's available to you, then, hey, that's a, that's a great place to start. Um, as your business grows and, you know, you get on, you know, hundreds and thousands of, of employees, then, you know, the, the, the needs uh, of what you're getting from that certificate can certainly change. And so you might need to kind of evolve uh, with the capabilities of your certificate. But as you can see here, so Chris, go ahead and let's go ahead and do a uh, install. So we saw the previously the website and it had the you know, the red triangle, don't, you know, be careful, be careful, be careful kind of a thing. And assuming we don't have any issues with site ground. Um, we'll get the, an install here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Normally only takes a couple of seconds for that to install. All right. Okay. So bada bing, bada boom, right? Very simple process. Now, if we go back to the website and we refresh that, we're going to see now we've got that lock, right? Now we've got a sense of, uh, you know, presenting a sense of security uh, to our users. And if they're interacting with our website, all of that information that's being exchanged across there uh, is being encrypted. Now, the encryption process, if you're not familiar with it, is, is basically what it does is it takes plain text, the stuff that we, you know, humans can kind of read and understand, and it con converts it into something called ciphertext. And so it's all jumbled up and you can't really read it and understand what it is. And then at the other end of that transaction, so between the web server and your browser, they exchange a key, then it kind of unlocks that information. So when it gets to your browser, it's able to then kind of unlock that, decipher the information, and now you're able to kind of read that information in a plain text format. So any information that you're exchanging with the website gets protected through that, through that encryption process. All right, Chris, you wanna? Pass back over screen share. Okay, so if you're using GoDaddy, those might already, you know, as soon as you sign up for hosting, you might get that automatically. Uh, but understand that, you know, just from a from a protection on your end of the of the uh, from a user perspective. If you go to a website and you see a message pop up that there's an issue with the certificate, that's that's one of those moments where you need to stop and go, okay, is 
is, is, is everything okay here? Because the bad guys, they're, they're, you know, the, the DNS servers can be compromised. Uh, at one point uh, in, in the past, we actually had certificate authorities, the ones that issue these SSL certificates, they have been compromised. But if you get a message that says, hey, there's something wrong with this certificate, you know, you want to kind of click and just look at that information. Now, you don't have to be technical to kind of see, you know, in that, in, in that message, that window that pops up that tells you whether something funky is going on or not, right? If you're going to www.mycompany.com and the certificate error simply says, Yes, the certificate was issued to mycompany.com, but it's expired, right? Okay, well, that can happen, right? If the business owner isn't maintaining the certificate and keeping it updated on an annual basis or renewing their hosting and you know doing all these kinds of things that would typically ensure that that certificate is being refreshed, then, then maybe that's fine, right? Click OK and you continue to the website. But if you're trying to go to www.mycompany.com and the certificate doesn't match that, that's that's that stop, you know, stop, don't go forward uh, type of a message, right? We want to be very uh, concerned about what is happening, you know, if that website has been compromised or certificate, um, a man in the middle attack, there can be a number of different reasons why there isn't a sync between that certificate uh, and, and the website itself, because that certificate is is designed to prove identity, right? And, and establish trust. All right, okay, so uh, site certificates. Uh, so we just saw that. So the other part is the spoofing of the people, us. Um, and there are some records out there that we can put in that DNS, in that DNS uh, system that we have access to that can, will help kind of protect us, our email. So our identity, we're sending out emails to, um, to customers and, you know, suppliers and those types of things. We want them to be certain that that email is coming from us, our business, our trusted source uh, of that. And these records, this SPF record, the DMARC, DKIM, and we've got this new one called BIMI are out there are designed to do just that, right? Now, this has not necessarily anything to do with, hey, the email coming into, right? It's not providing any antivirus protection or anything like that. But what this is, is it's giving legitimacy to what, to us as an individual, our emails and how we're communicating out to our customers and third parties. So SPS, as you can see on the screen, you know, it talks about it prevents the forging of those emails. So if somebody is trying to pretend to be you and entering your domain, you know, there are tools out there that the hackers can use that are readily available. You can go download them right now for free and, and you know, do these kinds of, you know, spoofing exercises yourself, but they can kind of plug in your information. Now, the idea of SPF is, it says, hey, when that email arrives in somebody's email box, it's like this, this is something is wrong. This didn't come from a legitimate source to use, that's using this um, domain. And uh, in combination, SPF with DMARC and DKIM allows that receiver really kind of check to make sure that that email that they're receiving, receiving from that specific domain is authorized and it's trusted. Um, this new standard that's out there now is, is BIMI, as you can see on the screen, is where the, they've, they're creating this ability for now to us to kind of create these images, these logos that can go into uh, our email to help us establish our brand. And that's what BIMI stands for, brand indicators for messaging, message identification. So we're sending a message out there, we're sending emails, that we get it, we're getting this ability to kind of brand it with these little logo types of things. And uh, the rollout of BIMI is, you know, has started, but it's still in its early days kind of a thing. Um, and depending upon, um, you know, which, which service you're using, if like Verizon supports the use of 
uh, and uh, Yahoo, AOL, you know, those kinds of email addresses and hosting services provide uh, support BIMI today. Uh, Google supports it. Uh, but depending upon, you know, who you're working with to establish kind of that BIMI presence, um, the requirements for doing that uh, are different. So, for example, Google, you know, requires something called a verified mark certificate, uh, which actually in order to qualify to get that, you actually have to own the trademark for, for that image that you're using. So, you know, if you've got your logo with a couple of letters in it or whatever, and you've been using it for 10 years, but you've never trademarked it, then you're not going to be able to kind of implement that BIMI capability, uh, certainly not through Google. So if you're using G Suite or Google as your backend hosting for your website, um, you're not going to be able to kind of get there. So just kind of keep that in mind as you're going to start to see these kinds of things roll out. Again, other things that we can do to establish, a, you know, uh, a solid reputation for our companies and help ensure that, you know, the, the folks that we're communicating with uh, can trust the source of the information that's, that's coming across. All right. So let's, uh, so you know, these records, and you know, as I mentioned, these are DNS records and, you know, the SPF and the DMARC and, you know, this can sound very complex and, 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 and difficult. And, you know, it, it can be, you know, if you don't put the right information in these records, then you might not get your email, right? It, it, so, you know, there, there's, uh, or your email may not uh, work correctly. So there is some sensitivity to it. But the process itself is, is relatively straightforward. And again, because uh, companies like SiteGround and, and Google and Wix and, and Microsoft, and you know, we're using the hosted exchange, the support for putting these kinds of records in place, it can be very straightforward. It's not necessarily there by default. So you might have to take some action to kind of put these in place. But even when you're doing that, They've gone a long ways to really kind of help make it easy for you to do that um, by, you know, clicking a button or sliding something, or it's going to generate a record for you that you can put in. So let us just kind of show you here. Chris, you want to take back over and and uh, we'll we'll show some of that. Yes, so sir. just how easy that is. Okay, so let's go look at the DNS zone editor there. Okay, so this is SiteGround. Uh, if, you're, if you're using you know, Wix or GoDaddy, you're gonna have something that's, that's similar to this, okay? Uh, and as you can see here, um, there are uh, several different types of, of records that, that are in our DNS system. And they have different functionality, as you can imagine. Now, when we get into the SPF and the DKIMs and those kinds of things, we're, 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 we're using what's called a text or a TXT uh, type of a record to put it in there. But uh, so, for example, you see uh, the, an A record here. This is really just kind of showing the host uh, address associated with the domain name server. Uh, the C name is a canonical name. Uh, that gives record, it's that alias, you know, for the www uh, or converting your website. Uh, the MX is that mail exchange record. So this is, has related to our, obviously our email. So uh, uh, as information moves across the internet, right, um, um, you've got your, you know, your, your regular web traffic, you know, that you're kind of going to websites on. And then of course we have email. Well, a DNS server or our servers or our mail servers or web servers, they are set up to kind of deal with these things differently. So our DNS needs to need to know, okay, for, for website traffic, we're going to point you to, you know, over to this IP address and, and this is where you need to go to do website. But maybe we're using Outlook for exchange for our email uh, or Google or something like that. 
So that's very different. We've got our website that's being hosted by one company. We've got our email that's being hosted by a different company. It's these records, like the MX records, that is telling um, the, the, the world and uh, all of these different DNS servers where stuff needs to kind of go. So send my web stuff here, but send my email stuff there kind of a thing. Okay. All right. So uh, if we want to, let's see here. So we can see down here, um, um, we've got right there, that, that third one down, that SPF record, right? So this is where we're going in. And, and as we'll see, you know, SiteGround provides a tool and will help us, you know, generate this information. Okay, so it's not like you need to become an expert on, oh boy, what does V equal SPF1 plus A plus MX? You know, we, we can tell you what those things mean. The, the V is the version number. So whether it's SPF1 or DKIM1, these are versions of those technologies or those supported uh, uh, services that are underneath there. Uh, the plus A is an inclusion of different IP addresses. Uh, the MX, those are a mail exchange service. So yeah, there, there can be a bit of complexity behind that, but you don't have to know that, okay? Where when you, if you're setting up something in Outlook, they're going to tell you. They're going to say, create this, this SPF record, okay? Create this DKIM record. And they're going to give you exactly what you need to do. So you'd come in here and you create a new new record, as you can see in that upper section there. And bada bing, bada boom, it can be very straightforward. Okay. Now, the way that these changes work is, you know, because it's 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 a big world, <laughs> a big interconnected world. It takes time for those changes to propagate around the globe, okay? So if we made a record change here, it's gonna show up pretty quickly, you know, locally in, in the environment where our hosting is, is going on in, in, in the United States. But, you know, if, it's, if our hosting company is out of Virginia, it's gonna move there pretty quickly, but it's gonna, it might take 30 minutes for it to reach, uh, you know, DNS servers in Dallas and maybe an hour for them to reach, you know, in LA and maybe another four hours for them to reach, you know, Europe and Asia and kind of span around the globe because it's pushing, it's, it's getting those changes and it's, you know, validating them and then it sends it and it sends it and it for, forwards it on. So these DNS changes can take, you know, up to 24 hours for them to kind of get all the way around the world. So what happens when, hey, I've got a DNS record that says my email is this, and you know, in, in Australia, but the one that I, the, the DNS server you know, in Virginia says something different. Well, that's why we wanna keep uh, our, our emails supported for both of those systems at the same time, but eventually they will transfer over. So uh, you, know, you might be in Google for, you know, and in Outlook for a day, but at the end of that day, everything would have been migrated over to, you know, to Outlook and, you know, you can stop using the Google system because you have confidence that all the email is coming to and going out of, um, out of the, uh, using all the, the record information, DNS record information uh, uh, that you've added. Okay. All right. So let's show uh, uh, Chris down in the, where it uh, generates or makes the recommendation. Yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, so as I said, depending upon your hosting company, you know, although this can be complex information, you'll they'll they'll likely are going to give you the information that you need. Okay, and and that's what's great about all of this is that you know the mere mortal, you know, the those of us you know, if you're not a cybersecurity expert, you you don't necessarily have to be. Uh, that um, because you're getting a lot of this information uh, generated for you. So here's an example of, you know, where uh, we've got all this information is pre-propagated for us, okay? 
because our hosting company knows this stuff. They know what the approved IP blocks are. They know what the include list is and the approved host needs to be an asterisk because we're gonna include everything in there, approved MX records, everything in there, that's gonna be an asterisk and it's gonna generate this SPF record in there. If we went, you know, obviously if we go look and we're gonna see this, this SPF record exists. So that's the beauty of, you know, some of the systems that are out there is they're doing a lot of this for you but you need to make sure that they're out there. So, uh, Chris, let's go take a look at like a DNS checker. And so, it, you know, you can go out on the web and, and you can do this DNS check. And, uh, and as you make changes, as I was mentioning, how things kind of propagate around the world, if we were to make a DNS change, you see like, well, there's somewhere, somewhere in the world, there's, a, you know, maybe a red X or, or, or what you'll see is, you know, you might have X's on the outside and green check mark, but then if you continue to kind of refresh and it, you, you can watch, you can literally kind of watch those DNS record changes make their way across the globe. So it's kind of a, a, a cool and interesting thing to see, but you can come in here and you can see, well, what do these DNS servers show in one part of the world versus, you know, my part of the world? So um, it's a, you know, a good tool to, you know, to see and use and that kind of a thing. Um, and then the BIMI. So the, the BIMI, as we mentioned, is, uh, is, is, is new and, you know, likely it's going to become more and more popular. You're going to hear more and more about it. You're going to, you know, you're going to start getting emails from, you know, different companies and they're going to have the logo and then you're going to be like, oh, how do I get that logo? Uh, well, you'll know that, hey, this is, you know, this is what it kind of takes. So, so we don't have a, bit, a BIMI record for our test site here, uh, but we can go out and we can do a check, you know, tell us, hey, our MX record shows this, our SPF record shows this, and, uh, but obviously we don't have anything in there for BIMI. But if you were to do that same kind of a checking, if you wanted to, you know, monitor the DNS checking, you could use that, that previous website. If you want to monitor the status of your BIMI, uh, implementation, then you can use this, uh, this BIMI inspector to do that. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks, Chris. Can you transfer that back, please? Mm -hmm. All right. Oops. Okay. So, yeah. So we, we've, we've talked about, you know, kind of helping protect, you know, spoofing of our, our identity to the world. Obviously, phishing, uh, spear phishing, and whaling, these are things that we have to be uh, very cognizant about. The, 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 the majority of cyber attacks uh, come through us humans, right? So, you know, John McAfee, the, you know, the, the former, uh, assuming he's, he is really dead, <laughs> he's one of those eclectic fellows, you, you, may or may not be dead kind of a thing, but um, he's the founder of the McAfee uh, antivirus. And at one point he had said that, you know, humans are the weakest link in the cybersecurity chain. And, and, you know, considering the fact that, yeah, the majority of attacks do come through us humans, you know, there's some degree of legitimacy to that, but we can transform ourselves into the strongest link, right? If we become you know, smarter about what's happening. So the majority of the attacks are certainly, you know, just these broad phishing attacks. It's the, you know, just, you, you, you know, they're just, there's no personal reference to you, your name, um, you know, nothing in there. Um, they're just casting a very wide net trying to get people to fall for it kind of a thing. Um, and then spear phishing is, is, is much more targeted. And you'd be surprised that, you know, you know, depending upon the nature of your business, you know, who you're, you know, who there might just be, you know, random attackers out there. Um, but there are um, malicious actors out there that will sell their services. So um, depending upon, you know, the business environment you work in, uh, if you have a, you know, if you have an, a competitor that, you know, wants to come after you, you know, there, there certainly is a, a, a chance that they could go out and they could employ one of these malicious actors. They will go out and they will spend the time to under, go and understand your business, 
who do you who do, who are some of your partners and your suppliers uh, and they'll build an understanding of what your your operational ecosystem looks like so that they can craft something that is meaningful and 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 try to kind of trick you into um, clicking on that link uh, opening that file you know whatever that is uh, and it, it, it might be business related or they might go out and say, hey, you know, this, OK, this person graduated from Boston University, you know, tw- you know, 15 years ago. Uh, we're OK, it's uh, oct- you know, we're almost into October. So there might be um, maybe a, uh, a holiday reunion coming up. Uh, OK, so let's create a let's create a an invitation to the Boston College, um, uh, you know, holiday event to be held in sunny Orlando, Florida. Right. If you're a graduate from Boston College and it's it's you know, it's coming into the holiday season, you might go, hey. Click and open that file. Right. And next thing you know you've been compromised. So you have to kind of understand that, you know, the, the bad guys can, can, will absolutely invest the time and energy to target you as an individual very specifically to try to get you to open something. Okay. So we'll get into, you know, some of the, the signs here, but, uh, and then whaling is where if you're an executive at the company, they're going to invest even more time in energy and trying to get you because they know you're going to have some escalated types of privileges, authority to be able to do these things. And so, you know, if you if you think of these things in terms of what we were just talking about with the email, so if you've got, you know, internal employees that, that are exchanging emails, hey, send an invoice, send a payment, and that kind of a thing, if your email address is being spoofed, then maybe your accounts payable person gets fooled into thinking that that email that just came in about paying this invoice is legitimate, right? So that's why it's important to implement those, the the email, uh, the SPF, the DKIM, and the DMARC to help protect your own brand, not only just with those external, but also internally as well, okay? All right. Um, All right. And, you know, this whole idea about, you know, social engineering and uh, you know, that's where they're going to go out and get this information. So we need to be definitely careful about how much information we put out on those social networks, right? You probably have heard it time and again, LinkedIn, right? We, 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 want, to, we want to present this image of professionalism and maybe, you know, power and expertise and, and those kinds of things. But keep in mind that the bad guys will look for things like that. If you've got systems administrators in your organization, then you've got a core system that they work with and it's a, a financial system and it's got a name and it, you know, it, it's easy for the attacker to go look for system administrator for this software system, you know, and they'll get a sense that, okay, well, if I can compromise this person, then I'll get access to this backend database and I'll be able to steal these kinds of records. Okay. So, you know, just be careful about what you put, how much detail you put on those social networks. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So some of those common signs of phishing. So, you know, uh, you know, the sender's address and as you, you know, you may, you may know today, you can either hover over it or you can click on that address and we want it to be, you know, we want it obviously to, you know, if it's coming from, you know, Doug Williams from, you know, X, Y, X, Y, Z company, we're going to expect to see something that resembles that in that email address. So that's definitely, uh, you know, a, a sign. Um, and, you know, if we're talking about that sender, you know, it, you know, if it's addressed from coming from somebody you've never heard of, right, you, you've never done business with them, that's your immediate, you know, stop and, and let me check. So just like that Boston University, uh, invitation. If you have never received a Boston University invitation for a reunion, that's a stop and think. Yes, it's it, it sounds, it feels legitimate, right? It's hitting home, but that's exactly what the bad guys are striving for. But if you've never been invited, you've never seen one of these kinds of things, if it's not common practice 
for you to every early you know, late September or every early October to get one of these things. That's your stop and think, right? Uh, obviously, you know, in the messaging, if it sounds too good, or you better do this now, or this bad thing's going to happen, uh, you know, uh, or if it's involved in a financial transaction of any kind of a thing where it's it's telling you to take action, again, that's a stop and think. And yeah, we 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 can tend to get a lot of emails, but not a lot of them are phishing emails. So we're going to get a lot of legitimate stuff. It's the ones where, you know, we're built in with you know this inherent intuition and you know that feeling it's what you know when it strikes that that's your moment where you need to just stop and think okay uh don't override it with a cognitive bias around oh nobody would ever attack me well that's not true right because the way the attackers uh may approach your organization is is you might be um you know, third in the line of suppliers to to the company they they actually want to target. Okay, so you imagine the big company; they have lots of money. They have lots of you know, they've got an information technology staff. They've got an information security team. Uh, they can invest in a rather you know robust and a mature cybersecurity practice. But what happens is is you know those big companies tend to do business with a lot of smaller companies who have less money, smaller staff, and then those companies do business with even smaller companies and even smaller. So depending upon where you're at in that supply chain, that relationship, you, they, you might be targeted, not because of what you have, well, what you have that's of value to them is that trust relationship between your business and the next higher business. So if they can leverage that trust relationship, if they can exploit that, they can get into the next bigger company. And then once they're in that environment, then they'll exploit that trust relationship to the next bigger one. And they move up. And that's that's what we'll call a supply chain uh, compromise. OK, we, we, there are lots of different ways you can compromise the supply chain, but that is certainly one way of doing it. So, so even though you might feel like a smaller fish, uh, in the ocean, understand that the bad guys will um, will leverage that uh, as a as a means to compromise the big guys. All right, um, all right. Uh, then grammar. So you know, you know it. It's a factor, but don't make it be. You know, obviously the deciding factor. Not everybody's. You know, has mastered the English English language. Obviously, you know, I haven't even mastered the English language. So, you know, and, and, you know, typos and misspellings, they, you know, they happen, right? And, and depending on who you're interacting with, you, you, you know, you'll, you'll kind of know, right? But, but it becomes a, you know, one plus one kind of a thing, right? If you're already not expecting it, and now it's poor grammar, you're going, okay, this doesn't feel right, right? Your, your intuition is telling you, don't do, you know, delete the email, then do that. Now, if your organization is, you know, big enough and you've got, um, you know, information security team, then, you know, maybe you forward it to them and, and, and let them investigate it, right? See whether, you know, some that attachment is legitimate, you know, or that URL is, you know, malicious, you know, let them do that. Um, you, if you don't have that, if you're a small business, then, you know, you can simply delete the email, if, you know, but, but if you if you think you know wow well, this might be le you know legitimate, then you know if, if if it's coming from an organization that you've done business with, then you know pick up the phone, you know and and call that known entity. Don't call the phone number that's in the email, okay? Because the bad guys you know just be sitting on the other end of the phone saying yeah yeah we just sent you that email you know you need to pay that invoice. No, you don't want to do that, right? You want to go to a known trusted source. Right. Create a separate email if you need to. If you've done business with, you know, Sally at, you know, Acme Company, you know, for the last 10 years and you've just got a reset or, you know, request for a, a change of an invoice information or, a, a you know, a, an account number at a bank and it's coming from, you know, Bob at Acme Company, you probably want to pick up the phone and, and call up Sally you know, and say, hey, 
uh, just an email from Bob from your company telling me to change, you know, go to that trusted source, you know, and, and that picking up the phone or op- creating a new email. Don't reply to the email that was sent. Don't call any phone numbers in that email. You know, it's just, you know, the, the bad guys can just be sitting there on the other end of the, on the line for that. Uh, but, but yeah, certainly, you know, consider that, you know, the, the, the grammar is a factor, but it's not the, uh, the end all be all. All right. Okay. So ransomware. So, um, we, we've all heard about it, and I've, I've talked about what happens, right? You open this email, and next thing you know, you can't get to your, your laptop because there's this big, scary screen, and it's demanding, uh, you know, you make a payment uh, via Bitcoin, which is, uh, you know, a, a digital currency that's out there. So uh, the general recommendation is that you, you don't make that payment, and the reason why is twofold. Uh, first of all, we don't want to encourage the bad guys to continue to do this by, you know, keep funding them by making these payments. And the other is that there's no real guarantee that that key, after you've made the payment, that whatever that tool is or the key that they give you to decrypt the information, there's no guarantee that it's going to work. Okay. And there's no guarantee that they're not going to go, oh, you know what? You just paid us $900, but we've changed our mind. We now want $2,000, right? And you just, you just get continued to be blackmailed into doing this. So the, the easiest, the best way to just protect yourselves and help you sleep better at night is to have a robust uh, backup system. And it, it, keep in mind that, you know, you can go down to Best Buy and you can buy these very inexpensive devices that you can plug in through the USB uh, and very quickly gain this kind of backup capability. But, but understand that you've got your data, right? The data that you use, your files, your folders, and you know, your customer records and all this kind of stuff, right? That's important, right? That you, you want to have. But, you know, you, you know, two years ago, you bought a brand new laptop or a workstation and you went home. And over the last two years, you've added lots of different software to it and you've configured it. And, you know, you, you've added these tools and these technologies to your new computer that's different. That's, that's an image of your laptop, right? And, and that is a different kind of the set of data. That's a different kind of a backup that you need to have in place to be able to restore to. So if you're struck by a ransomware, the, the, the easy way to kind of get around that is to recover from a, you know, just use the operating system to recover to a known good state and then access your files that you have in your backups. And bada bing, bada boom, the ransomware is gone, right? Delete that email, don't click on that again, kind of a thing. Um, but you have to can think about, I need, I've got my system image and I've got my data. Both of those you need to be able to recover too. Your system data, if you're using a, a Windows system, you know, there are restore points and there's, there's a schedule that you can put it on to, you know, daily you can create these restore points or, you know, set up a frequency so you have something to fall back on. And it's the same kind of thing with your backups. And whether you're storing it locally or you're storing it into the cloud, uh, you can create a full backup, which means it's going to take a full copy of everything. And a lot of times what it'll do is it'll take a full copy and then it'll do what's called an incremental. So uh, on my, Sunday night, we take a full copy of everything. But on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we're taking incremental. So it's just going to keep track of the changes between the full and what and what has happened in that given day. Okay, so you've got that. What that means is when you have to recover, you have to recover to the full, and then you've got to kind of add those incremental recoveries to it, right? To kind of bring you back to the current state. Um, The another option is this continuous data protection, and that's where Hey, as soon as you make a change, it's immediately being reflected somewhere else. Okay. So it's not, you're not doing a backup at, you know, midnight on Sunday. It's as soon as you type it, it's showing up. And there are options out there, you know, for those, like I said, you can do some stuff locally or you can do it out on the cloud. 
but I, you know, the, the, you know, the thing to consider, as I mentioned before, is don't forget about your system. You know, data is important, but don't forget about that system that you have to recover to. All right. So uh, thank you. So let's uh, any Q and A. Hey, Jeffrey, thank you. We had one question in there um, that uh, I know Christopher answered it uh, typing back, but I want to share it. It says, oh. I have two cybersecurity issues uh, to share. I received an email signed by PayPal VP saying that they will charge my checking account for $497, then called PayPal fraud, and it's not from them. Is this a sample of phishing where I can? Call and ask. Yeah, ab yeah, absolutely. And and the thing to do is right. Obviously, don't 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 call any numbers in that email. Right, you go online, you go to PayPal.com. You know they'll have, uh, you know they've got a whole security division around the the phishing stuff. And and you know you just either call them up or open a open a question or open up a a ticket and just kind of explain to them. You know PayPal is great. You know these and a lot of you know these organizations, you know financial organizations are are great. They know this is going on, um, you know, and, and likely unless you're, uh, you know, you're, unless you're being whaled or you are being spearfished, the likelihood is that they've seen this kind of a thing, you know, a thousand times over, right? So, you know, they're going to say, disregard it. That never happened. You know, you're, you're not going to be charged $497, Right, but just go directly to the source. Don't interact with the email or the people on it. Um, so yeah, and, and and if something you know malicious, if something fraudulent did happen, that's what's you know as I'm saying, it's great about the financial companies. A lot of times they'll you know they'll they'll fix that financially. They'll reverse it or they'll give you some kind of a credit or thing like that. Just don't. The, the, but ideally, you know, you're not falling for it. You know, another popular one is, uh, it, oh, I, you know, we've got video of you, you know, doing X, Y, Z that you shouldn't be doing, shame, 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 and we're going to release this to all the contacts in your email address. Well, you know, that's unlikely that that <laughs> ever happened, right? So, you know, don't fall for those kinds of things. Um, uh, unlikely that they're, they're, they're just, they're just fishing. Excellent. Thank you, Jeffrey. We are at a little past our time, so we need to go ahead and wrap up. But uh, thank you for being on this week. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week as well for another session. Um, we appreciate everybody being on here today for the boot camp. Thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you on Thursday morning at uh, 9 a.m. Until then, everybody have a great day, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. I know.